Yeah, welcome everyone um, to our, our third webinar. Um, yeah, really happy that we get more and more people uh, who register and I hope also more and more will figure out how to join. So for the topic for today, I selected coral bleaching and fluorescence because I think it's something that is interesting for divers because you can really see this, this nice colors or uh, night dives, you can see um, bright green colors where yeah, normally you wouldn't see nothing. So yeah, I hope that you'll find this interesting. Yeah, today I will talk a little bit first about the background and then I will present uh, this paper, Optical Feedback Loop Involving Dinoflagellate Symbiont and Scleractinian Host Drives Colorful Coral Bleaching. It sounds very scientific, um, but it's, it has a very nice message and I will break it down for you so that it's easy to understand. And as a reminder for everyone who is new, who's joining for the first time, uh, whenever there are technical terms, this little shark will swim through and uh, Fira will paste the terms and the definition into the chat. Yeah, just as a reminder, coral reefs are built by organisms, are built by uh, cnidarian animals, the corals. And um, we talked a lot about what corals are and how they built these structures already in the past webinars. And today I would like to focus a little bit more about the symbiosis that exists between corals and uh, their symbionts. So um, everywhere inside their tissues, corals contain the symbionts called zooxanthellae. And these are algae dinoflagellate or algae symbionts that can conduct photosynthesis. So they produce um, sugars for the coral. So they provide food for the coral and they just need sunlight and nutrients. And this symbiosis is really important for corals to survive over a long time and to stay healthy and yeah, remain in good physical conditions. And what is normally the case is that um, this is how a healthy looking coral looks like. It's brown, it's colored, and its color comes from the symbionts. So they are distributed in the coral tissue. A coral that is brown has brown symbionts, a coral that looks green has green symbionts. And yeah, if everything is, is good and healthy environmental conditions are like uh, corals like them, then it's like this. If a coral starts to get stressed, these symbionts will not be beneficial anymore for the coral because they start producing, producing toxins. They are not conducting photosynthesis in an efficient way anymore. So then um, the coral will expel the symbionts. So you see these brown cells uh, moving out. And this means that the coral, this whole structure will not look brown anymore, but, but will start looking paler. So the more symbionts move out, the paler it looks like. And if this continues for a long time, at eventually the coral will be completely bleached. So all the symbionts are gone and the coral will look white. It doesn't mean that it's dead, but it means that there's no more algae um, that you can see that gives it a color. So you're looking straight through the transparent tissue onto the white skeleton. And this is what generally is called coral bleaching. The, ble the reasons why bleaching can happen, um, so why a coral gets stressed, can, can be different reasons. Um, the most common is environmental stress because of hot temperatures. So warming temperatures will cause uh, the coral to be stressed and bleached, but also pollution can be a cause or too many nutrients being brought in or too little nutrients. 
but also if the coral gets exposed to the sun for a too long time. So we all know that UV radiation can be really harmful. Um, that's what happens to the coral also, it gets stressed, but also um, if it gets exposed to air. So being exposed to air can happen during extreme low tides, for example. And this can also be a consequence of changing climates that uh, tides become more extreme and corals are exposed for a longer time. So um, yeah, coral bleaching is really just a condition of stress that leads to us looking through the transparent tissue onto the white skeleton. And last year, we have seen a lot of coral bleaching at the Banda Islands also. So here are some examples how corals may look like if they are completely bleached like this one, or if they just started bleaching, you can see the most exposed parts are turning white, the rest is still brown. Some might uh, look slightly yellow. And in this one, you can also see that it's uh, partially bleached. And if you look at the incidence of these so-called bleaching events happening, um, it has become more and more frequent in the last years, over the last decades. So this graph published by Hughes in 2000, 2018 shows severe and moderate bleaching events from 1980 until 2016. And the first really bad bleaching event ever recorded was in 1998, you can see here. Um, and these are all, these are about 100, these are 100 sites that were monitored yearly. So this is quite a reliable indicator of which years were really bad. And then you can see it happened again, 2006, I think that is, and 2010 and 2016. And last year again, so 2020, we had uh, another bad bleaching event worldwide. So, so far it is believed that the 2016 bleaching event was the worst that ever happened. And these are examples, um, pictures from bleaching all around the world. Hawaii, Fiji, New Caledonia, La Réunion, and the Great Barrier Reef. So large scale bleaching. Um, but also uh, people realized that after these extreme global bleaching events happened, researchers starting to realize that some corals suddenly started to be colorful. Maybe someone who's not familiar with the topic might think, oh, this is a very beautiful, colorful reef. Um, but actually, this is also a sign of stress. This happens only during or after coral bleaching. And these incidents of colorful bleaching were observed from 2010 until 2019 in many different places around the world. You can see here um, Pacific Islands, in Central America, um, in the Indian Ocean, in the Indo Pacific. So everywhere uh, researchers recorded sudden, that suddenly corals became really colorful. <clears throat> So I will get back to this, this event of colorful bleaching and to these incidences, and we will talk in detail what it means. But first, I would like to talk a little bit about color in general. What is light and what are colors? Um, light is uh, basically electromagnetic radiation. And this is electromagnetic radiation in within wavelengths of 400 to 700 nanometers. 
So this is what we can see, yeah, the visible light. And what color we see depends on what wavelengths of light there is. So the wavelengths to remind you is um, yeah, how they're uh, drafted here. So um, the, the length between one or, or basically one oscillation in this curve of electromagnetic radiation. The smallest particle um, of electromagnetic radiation or in light is, is a so-called photon. And um, so what you can see here, or the colors that, that we see, depends on which wavelengths the light has. And what is important to note is that small wavelengths are of high energy and high wavelengths are of low energy. We know this, we always know that UV radiation is dangerous for our skin. So this is high energy light. Yeah. High energy light is basically harmful to life. Everything outside this visible light range, so there's a huge range outside the visible light range, to the lower edge that's UV light, <clears throat> and to the higher edge that's infrared um, radiation, but we can't see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And all divers, I think, are familiar with what light does when it um, meets the ocean, when it penetrates the ocean surface. I'm sure you have seen this in your, something like this in your dive training. Um, water absorbs light. And the smaller the wavelengths, the, um, the deeper light can penetrate. So if we go back, yeah, blue light has quite a short wavelength, red light has a long wavelength, and red light with long wavelengths is absorbed really quickly. So we cannot see red light, red colors, when we dive really deep. Yesterday when I dove in Caraca, my first dive here in Banda after a year, uh, on 25 meter I saw a bright red crab. So this is something weird. Um, you would think, oh, red light cannot penetrate so deep. And this has to do with fluorescence, where we will come to in a bit. And we see the ocean as blue, because blue is the wavelength that penetrates the deepest into the ocean. So to understand everything that's going on with colorful bleaching, we also need to talk a little bit about pigments. Um, pigments are basically light capturing factories. They're light harvesting factories and the most best known pigment is probably chlorophyll. Everyone has seen plants and knows that chlorophyll is part of plants. And chlorophyll is the energy harvesting particle in plants. That's how plants can conduct photosynthesis. That's how they catch the light. So what pigments do is um, they absorb many, a wide range of different wavelengths and reflect a very small range of wavelengths. So a large amount of the light is absorbed by the pigment. And if you imagine that the, there's coral tissue lying beneath the pigment, so going back to our system of the algae symbiont and the coral tissue, the algae symbiont contains a lot of pigments and these are shielding the coral tissue from radiation because they absorb most of the radiation. So this is the natural protection that a coral has under normal condition when it's well colonized by symbionts. I 
uh, Sharks and Fru for Gira to post the next term. And the reason why, for example, you see chlorophyll, um, uh, why you see plants as green is because chlorophyll reflects green light. So this, in the case of chlorophyll, this would be green wavelengths. Yeah, but what is this? What happens if we see corals really colorful? So as I said, normally the pigments that give them the brown or green color are actually the algae pigments, the symbionts pigments. But um, we said earlier that when they are bleached, the color is lost, the, the symbionts are gone. So when the symbionts are gone, what gives them colors? And here we can distinguish between two different types of, of proteins. And these are either fluorescent proteins, which will look bright green if you look at them with a blue torch and a yellow filter. So for example, if you carry a blue dive torch and you have, you have a yellow mask over your own mask and so-called chromo proteins that for example, can make a coral look purple during daylight. And the difference between these two proteins is, is actually quite simple. What fluorescent proteins do, same like other pigments, they absorb light and they specifically absorb light that has a very high energy, so the harmful radiation. And then they can change, they shift the wavelengths of the light to a higher, a longer wavelength or lower energy. So what comes out has a higher, higher wavelengths and is lower energy light. This is a way of protecting also what is below. And chromoproteins um, have a very strong absorption and emit only very low amounts of light. So they protect what is below by absorbing almost everything. And corals can make use of these two different types of pigments, of proteins. I think now um, we are pretty well prepared to understand everything that the authors of the paper that I want to present did. If you have any questions, please ask in between also. So yeah, what I want to talk about now is uh, this paper published by different authors from different parts of the world. So what they did is um, they combined some field observations with lab experiments to find out what really happens and why corals become colorful and how this can protect a coral. So what they first did is they compiled all kinds of photographic evidence and asked eyewitnesses when they saw colorful bleaching, colorful corals. And they also collected aerial images. This was in New Caledonia and the Great Barrier Reef only. And then they looked at satellite data to later see how the water temperatures were during these times when the corals started colorful bleaching. And they broke this down to um, heat stress levels because not 30 degrees Celsius might be stressful for corals in um, more temperate areas, but it might not be stressful for corals that live in really warm conditions all the time. So they broke it down to heat stress levels. And what they saw was quite interesting. Um, you see the, what the bleaching temperature or the, the temperature here that is above normal. So the bleaching threshold. So it's not an absolute temperature because they're comparing different sites, but they defined the temperature that is the bleaching threshold when corals at that site started to bleach. And you can see different locations, Lizard Island, New Caledonia, 
and Okin Okinawa here, and Philippines and Palmyra. Palmyra is the Pacific island, sort of Hawaii um, on the right. So they saw um, at when the temperature is going up, when do corals actually start colorful bleaching? And the arrows here indicate the onset of colorful bleaching. So these are the days since the bleaching threshold was reached. And the numbers mean how long uh, it was after temperature started to go down anymore. So when the temperature peak was reached, the dots here, and then the temperature started to go down. And they found a pattern that um, these three sites, it was between 17 and 25 days after temperatures already started going down. Only then colorful bleaching started. In the Philippines and Palmyra, it was a bit different because there was not a clear raise in temperatures and then a drop again. But um, yeah, they had warm water periods for a really, really long time. And in Palmyra, the temperature was fluctuating a lot around the bleaching threshold. And what they found was that for all of these reefs, except for the Philippines, um, corals survived these bleaching events. There was really high survival. I think the lowest survival was 85% of the bleached corals. Only in the Philippines, 100% um, of the bleached corals did not survive. So yeah, they thought it, this colorful bleaching could have a really good impact on survival of corals and bleaching events. What they then did was um, that replicating or, or mimicking something like this in the lab. So they brought this coral, Coritis lichen, into the lab and artificially applied bleaching. And they bleached the corals with three different methods, applying red light, applying heat stress, and nutrient stress. So for the red light stress, the reason why they applied red light stress was that um, this is a way of bleaching a coral without exposing it to different wavelengths of light, because they wanted to see which wavelengths of light or which color of light is responsible for the onset of fluorescence or colorful bleaching. So what you can see here is the pretreatment. It's all dark, your red light, can't see much. And after, the, after 11 days of red light exposure, the coral was bleached. And these bleached corals were then exposed to either green light or to blue light to find out which is actually setting off that the coral will start to produce these fluorescent proteins. And uh, this is what I saw. This is the emission ratio of green to blue light. So the higher it gets, the more it's shifted towards green. Yeah? The lower it is, the more it's shifted towards blue. So the corals that were exposed to blue light, these are the circles, over time, they were producing more and more fluorescent proteins. Yeah? They were emitting more green, green fluorescent proteins were produced. And the corals that, um, were exposed to blue light, uh, sorry, to green light, the squares, they did not start producing green fl fluorescent proteins. So this is what you see here. Green light didn't, blue light kicked this off. So um, yeah, the conclusion from this was that blue light might be the factor that actually induces the production of these green fluorescent proteins.
and um, yeah, the production of proteins is, can also be called upregulation. Up so the protein production was upregulated. And then they exposed the same coral species to heat stress. And this is very interesting. I hope you can see the graph well. So what they did was their first, um, yeah, this, this is a healthy coral on day zero, and they exposed the coral to heat. So the red fluorescence that you see here, the red line is red fluorescence, the green line is green fluorescence. And the red fluorescence comes from the symbionts. Chlorophyll has a red fluorescence. So as long as you can see a really high red fluorescence here, it means that there were symbionts around. And then shortly after the heat stress, bleaching started. And you can see that symbionts were leaving the coral tissue. So the coral bleached, and you can't see red fluorescence anymore. And slowly, so slowly, the green fluorescence started. So coral started upregulating green fluorescent proteins. But this only became really, really high, the upregulation of these green fluorescent proteins, when the corals were already well into recovery. So after the temperatures were already going down. And this matches the findings that they observed in the fields that the colorful bleaching only happened yeah, two, three or more weeks after temperature started going down. And the authors think that it might have to do with that if, if it's extremely hot, the coral needs other mechanisms to protect itself. So it can't invest its energy into producing fluorescent proteins, but it rather invests its energy into producing other proteins that protect their cells from degrading because of heat. This image C just shows you the difference, how it looked like. So um, the healthy coral under white light looked brown and um, under blue light with yellow filter, you can see the fluorescence. And when it was bleached, so at the end of the heat stress phase P2, it was white, but showed very, yeah, started showing brighter fluorescence. And D shows you again the ratio between green and blue emission. So we can see that over time, um, there is again a shift towards green light that was emitted, that came out. And then they wanted to know whether nutrient stress can uh, cause the same, can also cause corals to upregulate green fluorescent proteins. So they compared corals that um, had normal nutrient conditions, HN, HP means high nutrients and high phosphate, and HN, um, LP means high uh, nitrogen and low phosphate. So these corals were under phosphate stress. And over time, you can see here also that red emission is decreasing. So there are less symbionts and green emission is increasing. increasing so there's an upregulation of green fluorescent proteins. So again, the shift went from blue towards green over time. And uh, this is interesting. And, and this was the confirmation that nutrient stress is yeah, really harmful also for corals and that the combination of heat stress and nutrient stress might be specifically problematic. And of course, because yeah, it's colorful bleaching, they also had a look at the chromoproteins and conducted an experiment with a similar species, 
also a Coritis species, Coritis stomichalmus. And um, yeah, in this case, they compared a coral colony that is, is a, is a so-called color morph that does not express many chromoproteins. So yeah, there's lots of variation, genetic variation in corals as also in humans. So some have more colors, other, other, others less. And these, this is a more color morph with very little chromoproteins and this was high. So they bleached the coral again and then observed that in the one tending to building chromoproteins, that there was a high upregulation of chromoproteins and in the other one not. So after 26 days of recovery after bleaching, is what you can see here, the contribution of um, pigments, so the pigments, chromoproteins produced by the coral was um, much higher among the, the corals that tended towards producing chromoproteins. And this is an, plays an important role in the recovery of corals. And I think they summarized it really well in here. In a healthy state, there are the symbionts, the symbionts pigments that shield the coral tissue from harmful light. So just a little bit blue light and a little bit of other colored light um, penetrates into the coral tissue. When the coral is bleached, there's a lot of blue light and other light that can penetrate the tissue. And specifically this blue light will cause the coral to become colorful, which is a protection that the coral then has instead of having colorful symbionts. And as soon as this, as the chromoproteins are built, so if the coral is colorful, um, the coral tissue is protected. And because it's protected again, the symbionts can come back. They are not harmed anymore by UV. Um, they are not harmed anymore by harmful light. So they can come back and they will start recolonizing the coral. And step by step, the symbionts will take over the role again in protecting the coral from radiation. And this is why the authors call it an optical feedback loop. It's basically a circle of um, yeah, suffering and recovery, which is, which is triggered by light. So the offset of these pigments that protect the coral to be built is caused by blue light. Yeah, and so I think the really important message in this of this paper is that both types of proteins can really help corals to recover after a bleaching event. But also that they said that um, we should really not neglect nutrient stress. And this nutrient stress might be one of the reasons why the Philippine corals um, did not survive after this colorful bleaching. That's what I say. So, and the good thing is that this is something that can be easier controlled than um, climate change. It's very difficult on a local scale to reduce temperatures in the water, but it may be easier to avoid nutrient stress for the coral. So providing the best conditions ever in a reef is the best way of protecting corals from dying after bleaching. Yeah, fluorescence, so you've seen, has a big role in protecting organisms from harmful light. But you can also observe fluorescence in many 
other marine organisms. If you go diving with a blue light and yellow mass, you can see all kinds of colors suddenly coming up that otherwise we would never see and that during the day and daylight we can never see. So for example, this tube anemone or this anemone and there's also lots of crustaceans or crabs and shrimp and all these show all kinds of different colors caused by fluorescence. And yeah, keep in mind that fluorescence is a shift in wavelengths from harmful light to less harmful light. So it has all kinds of functions and purposes and yeah, can help marine organisms in all kinds of ways. There are also really fascinating marine fish that show biofluorescence in different colors. And it's still a huge field of research to find out um, if how these fluorescent molecules, for example, play a role in communication and all the other functions that, that they may have. So that's it for today. Thank you for joining. So before we start with the discussion, I'd uh, like to let you know about one thing. Um, after we had such a fruitful discussion last month about coral restoration, um, we developed a small working group, small task force to come up with something that may help divers, dive centers, student clubs, anyone interested to uh, put, put hands on in conservation, maybe even do small restoration projects or decide what's needed. So we want to develop a tool that will be helpful for divers and dive centers in the Indo-Pacific. And you can all help us if you just take one minute to fill in a questionnaire that you find on our website, Lumi Notion, and then go to uh, webinar and questionnaire. Fill this in so that we will start to understand what you really need, what the diving community need in order to conduct good, efficient and inexpensive conservation projects. Please also share this with your friends and uh, tell others about the webinar and then I will be looking forward to seeing you next time. Have a nice weekend.